Well, I am super excited to welcome Amanda Stern to the show. Thank you, Amanda, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I devoured your memoir. Um, it was so good. And normally, um, you know, I try to listen to books before I'm going to interview someone and I'm just casually doing it. But I, I became obsessed with listening to your book. It was so good. So for anyone who's raising a child with anxiety, I just feel like this is, this is the go-to book because you can read, in my opinion, like you can read a lot of parenting books on anxiety, mm -hmm. but until you get into like someone's head and their experience, right? at least that's how I learn. Like I love to learn from stories and from understanding mm -hmm. it. And that's what, that's what your memoir does. But anyway, that was my, like, that was like a monologue. <laughs> well, it, thank you. I like the monologue. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me. It really does. So let's back up. And um, if you could just tell everyone a little bit about you and about your book, that would be awesome. Sure. Um, so my name is Amanda Stern and I am a writer. I was born and raised in Greenwich Village. I grew up in um, the 70s and um, I wrote a memoir about growing up with an undiagnosed panic disorder. And what I tried to do was write it from inside the experience so that the book um, <clears throat> so that the book read is like an autobiography of an emotion. Um, I felt that the best way to um, communicate with an audience about what it feels like is to put them inside. Um, so that they could, I, so they could feel it as much as I could possibly manage um, to write a feeling. Yeah, and you do a really good job at that because I get anxiety. Um, I have anxiety. I am raising mm -hmm. anxious kids. I treat anxious kids. I eat, live, and breathe it. And even with all that knowledge and and personal experience, I still felt like I left learning more. Oh wow, that's yeah. amazing. That's yeah, great. Like, I, I don't think I understood separation anxiety to the level that you really help explain it. It's mm -hmm. not something that I, it wasn't my theme and right. it's not my children's theme as of yet. We're, it's progressing, but so far not so much. And so okay. I love the way you explain separation anxiety, especially, I mean, I think other people will get the benefit of the panic and all the other mm -hmm. things. But for me, like I felt like a student, I felt like I was really learning what it feels like inside of someone's body when they have separation anxiety. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's um, so important for parents to understand a, that. A friend of mine read a very early draft of the book and she came back to me and she was like, oh my God, I, I just realized something while I was reading your book. And I, I said, what? And she goes, I just, I, my brother would make me sit at the end of his bed growing up. And it drove me insane and I hated him for it. And now I understand that it was anxiety. And like, I have to apologize. I have to call him and apologize. I was like, yes, you do. So it was sort of a, you know, I had no idea that, that anybody would be affected in any way at all outside of, you know, just trying to understand um, my specific experience. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh, no, I actually think there's going to be a huge ripple effect because even with me, not to keep talking about myself, but even with me, you know, when, when even I hear my husband or in session the other day, somebody was telling their kid that they're fine, you know, you're fine. And normally I would probably like reframe that or I would, address mm -hmm. it, but I had so much more emotion behind my conversation with those parents. With, mm -hmm. well, with my husband. <laughs> right. I feel like I understood like how that would feel inside for that child to feel like they weren't validated. So, yeah, but let's get, let's, let's talk about, I'm like jumping all over the place cause I've been excited to talk to you, <laughs> but I think we can dive into from your childhood experience. Mm -hmm. Maybe first, if you can explain what it feels like to have panic and separation anxiety or, or any anxiety. As it, you, from the point of view of a, of a child? Yeah. Okay. So um, essentially, it, it's, very, um, it's very isolating because you know, <clears throat> you know something's wrong with you. Um, well, this is for someone who has anxiety and doesn't know what's wrong with them. Um, but it's very isolating because you don't know what's going on. You know that you're 
experiencing the world differently than you're s- supposed to be. Um, <clears throat> so you feel a little bit like an imposter. Um, and like um, you watch all these other kids living life sort of much more easily than, than you're living it. And, um, and your only real choice is to just fake it or pretend. And so you're sort of actively suffering all the time. Um, because the only way to get through a day is to, is to fake it. Um, and, you know, and then you have at home, you, you can sort of fall apart and, and no one knows at home what's going on with you. It's just a very isolating experience. You, you feel um, a little bit alien, you know, um, and it's also just terrifying because you're, you're experiencing these sensations that feel like death like you're dying and everyone around you when when they don't know what's going on everyone around you is telling you you're fine or it's okay and um the reason that that doesn't work is that from the child's perspective they're they're anything but okay um they're they're dying and um, so to hear a parent or an adult say, you're fine, you're fine, then you're even m- more isolated than you were to begin with. Um, and, and your world sort of starts to become a place where there are no adults and like you're in charge, which is horrifying. Yeah. And parents, it's like the intuitive approach to say you're fine. I think most parents think yeah. they're doing a good job, you know, that that's, that's the that's the intuitive thing to do when your child's not yeah. okay. Right. Of course. It makes perfect sense. And <clears throat> had I not been that child, I would probably do the same thing. And I, and I have found myself with my friend's kids saying like, don't worry. And I'm like, what am I doing? You know, <laughs> or like, like, and I've done that and I've stopped myself and I, I've said, I'm sorry, don't mean to say, don't worry. You do what you need to do and I'll be here. Um, but it's, it's like, I don't know what it is. It's, it's a reflex to, to do that. And it um, really is. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Think it, I don't think it comes naturally to like sit with anxiety or to allow someone to have anxiety. I mean, even just this morning, my seven year old's having major anxiety issues. Um, mm-hmm. And so she was anxious about going to school today. And I said, you know, so I was doing my whole, like my little thing, which I do is like, what's your green thought, you know, and your stomach's going to hurt, but that's okay. And she said, mom, it's just so hard. And I said to her, fresh from your book, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. I said, I get it. I know it's hard, you know, and, and I know that this is, this is a struggle. Um, but you can, you know, then I went into like kind of empowering her, but just sitting with her and letting her know, like, I get it's hard. You know, mm-hmm. I think that it's a simple step, but a lot of times we don't, we don't sit with our kids anxiety. We kind of move into like trying to make it better. Cause it's, it's, it's like almost physically uncomfortable for some of well, us. It's very, yeah. I think it's totally physically uncomfortable. I mean, it's, it's sort of like talking to someone about death, you know, and going to a, a person's house who's grieving. Our impulse is to say, let's think of all the happy, positive things. What do we have to look forward to? And it's like, no, nothing. We yeah. have nothing to look forward to. There are no positive memories. My husband just died or my kid just died. Like just yeah don't let me be so alone in this. Right. And yeah. I think silence and quiet and listening, it's not, we're not taught how to do it. We're taught how to fill the silence. Um, you know, so it's, it makes perfect sense that we're all sort of trained to do the opposite of what so many of us need, which is just someone to be quiet, you know, and just yeah. be with us so we're not alone. Yeah, I, I think it's such a good point. It's a simple point, but it's a point that is, it's complicated because it's hard to do. You brought up something else that was really important. So you didn't know what was wrong with you. And, it, right. and it's funny. And then you felt like an alien, which I'm having flashbacks. I totally felt that way too, mm-hmm. where like I interpreted my social anxiety as um, that I repel people. And people mm-hmm. just don't like me. And it wasn't mm-hmm. until my 40s that I actually had a name for it and realized people don't, I'm not repelling people. I have social anxiety, you know? So if we could let kids know earlier 
what their anxiety is. Even I like to even know like what your anxiety theme is. This is how Mm -hmm. your anxiety shows up. Yep. What would you recommend for parents? For, for what, for how to talk to their kids about their own, about the fact that they have anxiety? Yeah. I think a lot of parents don't want, like I work with a lot of parents who don't want to label. I'll, I'll, I'll hear that a lot. I don't want to like slap a label on them or I don't want them to think there's anything wrong with them. And so let's just talk about how they're nervous or let's just talk oh. about how we're all nervous. Right. Okay. So for me, it's like, um, like imagine going to the hospital and, um, the doctors, um, there's something your head has been hurting a lot and the doctors go in and they take an x-ray and they all know what's going on with you, but they don't tell you, they won't tell you. And it, you know, it, they all talk to each other about it and it's sort of keeping yourself from you so that you know, something's wrong with you. You know, other people know something's wrong with you. And the fact that there's this space in between the knowing and the not knowing is um, there's something so damaging for a kid about knowing that yourself is being withheld from you. So the isolation and the alienation that you already feel is doubled. Um, And it's important when you go to a hospital and you get a CT scan to know what the results are so that you can say, okay, I have a brain tumor. Is it benign or is it malignant? Is it the reason that I'm seeing the world in, you know, in trifolds or however it is? You know, it it gives you something to work with. It gives you a starting point. And also for kids, they need, they need things named. They, they don't know the world. They don't know um, how reality works. They don't. So if you're teaching them not to name something or not to empower themselves by letting them know what is happening in their own bodies, you're basically training your kid to not know how to handle um, reality and not know how to like, um, you know, you're setting them up for, um, for a life of um, putting other people in charge and, uh, of them. And um, it's just, it's, it's, not, it's not labeling, you know. It's, it's, what, when it's, it's labeling when you give your kid a standardized test, the test comes back, it says, uh, your kid has some sort of a learning disability. So let's route your child into this class for learning disabled kids and um, track your kid on this track. And that's labeling, yeah. you know, um, sort of like put a label on it, throw her into a class, dismiss what's going on. But giving your child the vocabulary and the language to be able to talk about their emotional state is the greatest gift that you could give a human being, you know, the facility to talk about what is happening inside their own bodies. Yeah, I agree. And I think that was beautifully put because, you know, you're really empowering your child. And I like that the visual of the space between, you know, Mm -hmm. what everybody else knows and what you know, because I always tell parents, um, I think they know, (laughs) you know, that they They have anxiety. They know more than anybody else. So oh, this yeah. is not going to be an aha moment for them. They're right. Living it. Yeah. I mean, it'll be an aha moment in a different way. Yeah. It'll be like, oh my God, it has a name. True. You yes. know? Like, exactly. Yeah. So it's sort of like, it's the same concept as when, if your parents are fighting a lot, um, your kid is absorbing the tension. You know, kids just absorb information because yeah. they don't have the facility for language that you have as an adult. So they absorb it without language, mm-hmm. which, you know, which is almost stronger yeah. an experience than absorbing with language. So they, they know. Yeah, they definitely know. So I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, you, you talk a lot about separation anxiety. And to me, I found that fascinating just from a child's mm-hmm. perspective and also how it kind of evolved into your adulthood. I thought that was really interesting because I think a lot of times we think separation anxiety 
is going to end in childhood. Mm -hmm. and do a, a great job of showing how it progresses into your other relationships and into how you interact with people in the world. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you can talk about from a, from a child's perspective, what do you think is the best way to handle separation anxiety? Cause separation anxiety is, it's a, it's a family affair. It's yep. not a child issue. Right. <clears throat> so I think with separation anxiety, an important and very difficult thing to do is for um, the parents or the parent to have a really serious look at themselves um, and, and be brutally honest. You know, where, how are you modeling um, anxiety for your child? How are you coping with um, separations? How are you coping with your child's separation from you? There are all these messages that we send that we are not aware we're sending. And because kids absorb so much of the emotional language um, and don't need words to pick things up, um, I mean, and, and neither do adults, quite honestly, but, but kids are just more spongy. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, you're doing, there's something that's being modeled for your child and they are learning the world from you. They're learning how to leave and come back based on how you leave and come back or based on how you treat their partings um, from you. So that's the first thing. You have to have a really serious look at what you're doing. And if you realize, oh, I know what I'm doing. If your child is six and up, you have every right to talk to your kid and say, you know what? I know you have a lot of problems leaving me and coming back. And I've, I've realized that it's, it's because of something that I've been doing. And there are some mistakes that I've been making. And, um, and here's what I've been doing. You know, you just break it down for a child. But, you know, here's what I've been doing that I feel is sending the wrong message. It's, you know, and I'm, I'm really, I want to do something different. I want to figure this out in a different way. So you, you're allowed to admit that you've made a mistake. In fact, I think more parents should admit to their kids that they've made a mistake and here's how they're going to address it and remedy it so that the kid knows, oh, it's okay to make mistakes and like reroute um, and start again. So that's one thing that I think is really important is to identify where you've gone wrong and if it's appropriate, you can bring it up with your kid. If it's a not appropriate, then obviously don't. But um, that's one thing. The second right, before thing, you go into the second one, can I dive into that one? Cause that, that, that is a lot to talk about. Okay. So, cause some parents may not know what they're doing. So could you give some examples of what parents might in, unintentionally be doing? Yes. Okay. So one thing that um, a parent could be doing is let's say their, their kid is leaving them to go away um, to a sleepover or um, to visit a relative. And, and you know that your child already suffers in this particular way. You know that. That is a fact that you know, right? So if you say to your kid something like, I'm going to miss you so much, or I don't know what I'm going to do when you're gone, or I'm going to be so lonely when you're gone, things that you think are um, telegraphing to your child how much they mean to you, that's not the way to do it. So what that is doing is it's saying, I can't take care of myself. Because you're leaving, I can't take care of myself. So you're putting so much on your child and you're basically letting them know that you're not going to be okay without them. And that is a terrible thing to put on your kid. And it's so innocent. It's yeah. so, it's so, mindless. It's so, um, of course, you're going to miss your kid. Of course, you know, you have no plans. You have to figure it out. Uh, again, it's one of those things that's so reflexive and, and you think that, that it's innocuous, but those things really um, can be very harmful and can prevent your kid from leaving you. Um, you know, 
So, you know, there are just other ways to approach it. And, you know, you can say like, I wonder what you guys are going to be doing this weekend. Here's what I have planned. It's yeah. almost better for a kid to hear that you have taken care of yourself. You are, and, and they want to know also because kids with anxiety, the biggest thing for them, what they fear the most, well, two things they fear the most, but one is uncertainty mm-hmm. and, and not knowing. So if um, a parent is basically saying, I'm uncertain about what I'm going to be doing. I don't know. Oh my God. You know, your, yeah. your kid is like, well, I can't survive this. If you don't know, and I'm already afraid of uncertainty, like this is the worst possible thing for me. You need to have a concrete plan in place. Even if you're lying and you have no plan, you can, you can say, I am going to be reading the newspaper. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to a movie. I'm making dinner. I'm going to the farmer's market, like whatever it is, tell your kid that you've got it under control. You've got structure and routine. Yeah, and let I mean, them not worry. It's a good point. I mean, what I see is with separation anxiety, and I think most of the parents I work with don't see it this way until I break it down, is that any child with separation anxiety I've ever talked to is either mostly worried about their parent, their mother's safety yeah. or well-being or their safety or well-being. You know, mm-hmm. And they might have a sprinkle of the other one, but normally, so if your child is worried about you, and you can tell because you say, what's the worst thing will happen when you go over to your friend's house? If the answer is, um, I'm not sure you're going to be okay, or you might get in a car accident, or somebody might kill you, those are the answers I typically hear, then it's about you as the mom. And then it's listening to what Amanda's saying, because then you're saying there's something that you're unintentionally projecting that says you're not okay. Right. And if if it's worrying about them... And like, are they going to be okay without you? You know, what if something bad happens to them? What if they feel sick and you're not there? What if blah, blah, blah. Then it's fostering that independence because they feel like you fix everything and they're not okay. Now, I mean, anxieties can be very physiological, but these are the ways it manifests because of maybe the the dynamic in the house. Right. And also, you know, it could be, um, you know, I only had one mother and one family. So I don't really know how it was and or it is in other people's families. But for me, you know, my mom um, was in a lot of ways um, helpless, you know, that was just sort of her, that's just sort of her um, uh, sort of demeanor. She's, you know, she's very fragile and, um, and she doesn't really know how to help herself. So I knew that without words. So my concern for her was, you don't know how to take care of yourself, but I know how to take care of you. And so that was part of, that was a huge part of it for me, was that I was picking up on something about the way that she existed in the world. And I knew that it wasn't, um, she, she, I didn't trust her to take care of herself. Yeah. Um, and, and there are reasons why I didn't trust her to take care of herself. So it's not, it, it's not ever just sort of invented, I don't think, um, that we worry. There's something, it could be the smallest thing, you know, that just sort of got globalized in your child's head. Um, but it's definitely something that is um, being... Reve- you know, projected. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I, mean, I think, you know, you could, you could be born with, you know, the pre-wiring to have anxiety. And then just like with OCD, the theme is going to depend on the environment, you know? And exactly. so, you right. know, my, my kids could be afraid of throwing up and they're afraid of pretty much everything, you know, and then maybe in another home because they are so sensitive. And I always say that that's the superpower of anxiety is that you're just mm-hmm. an emotional sponge. And so that could be good and that, that, that could be bad. Like you can totally pick up people's vibes and you're in, right. in tune. But that also means that you pick up the subtle things in the home, like mm-hmm. maybe an anxious parent or maybe a parent who isn't fully feeling confident to take care of themselves. And it's an unintention, unintentional message right. that the child is soaking up. Or the, the opposite, which I see just as much, which wasn't kind of going on in your family is, and maybe it was, um, you're not okay if I'm not with you, you know, 
I got you. I got everything. And so that's a different dynamic when it's really powerful. And mm -hmm. it, it comes from a caring place as well of, right. I got your back. Don't worry. Oh, you fell. I got you. I'm going to pick you up. Oh, you got something on your face. I'm going to clean it off. And yep. then it's like, well, how am I going to function without my mom? And right. so then anxiety manifests into some separation anxiety, which. Right. All right. So you had a yeah. second point and I cut you off before. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, what was my second point? Uh, we're talking about separation anxiety. Um, maybe this was my second point. I don't know. Um, okay. It could have been that uh, maybe a way to deal with it, um, to deal with separation anxiety uh, is to take the big scary event and break it down into really small parts so that you don't thrust your child into this, you know, terrifying event all at once, but you, um, <clears throat> you get them used to it. So you get them used to coming and going or going to this one person's house in small bits. Um, you know, in, in, for like in my, in my situation, when I was little and I had to leave my mom to go to my dad's house every other weekend, it was, um, it was the same weekend for me. It was like the first time every single time. So I, um, you know, I had panic attacks. I was tormented. I had this like terrible um, physiological sensations of um, counting down from being okay to being, you know, near my death. And, you know, one of the things that they could have done to help me is to say, okay, we are tormenting our child. Um, it's clearly not good for her, but um, the goal would be for her to be able to spend a weekend with her father and not be, um, you know, filled with mental anguish. So how do we, how do we reach that goal? Um, one thing to do is to just start small and maybe my dad could have come down to my house and spent time with me on my turf once or twice a week and let me be, you know, let me get used to him. And then maybe I could have gone up when I was ready, um, go up to uh, my dad's house with my siblings and drop them off and go home. And then the next time I could maybe stay for dinner and then go home, you know, just like yeah. you inch your way there. Um, you know, this is a sort of a silly analogy, but my, uh, my brother's a, a yoga teacher and he teaches Ashtanga yoga. And the way that he teaches it is that you, um, he teaches you one pose at a time and you can't move on to the next pose until you've sort of perfected the one before it. And that's sort of how, how it works is you have to, um, your kid doesn't move on to the next step until they're ready, you know, until they feel they're ready, until you feel they're ready, and then they can do the next, you know, face the next challenge. Um, and what if your child is never ready? Um, well, there would have to be some reasons why your child is never ready. And it, you know, in some cases, I think it's just very circumstantial, but in some cases, I think that's okay. Um, you know, if, um, you know, if your child is, is never ready to do something that, um, they don't ever need to really do if it's something that you want them to do, but they're like, this is not for me, then okay. But I think if the goal demands it, like yeah. if everyone, you know, if the goal demands it, then, um, you know, when your kid never gets over it, I, I then something, someone's not handling something right. Yeah. And I think um, that then that goes into the empowering and telling them, um, you know, why it's important to fight it, you know, developing those skills and those muscles. And I, I see parents, if I was to like really generalize, I see parents in two extreme camps, if they're going to be in an extreme camp at all, you know, mm -hmm. one is the old school. Um, I was fine. You're fine. You know, stop coddling that. her, just suck it up, deal with it. You're going right. Suck it up, buttercup. Like that's, that's the one. Right. The spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is over empathizing a lot of times right you know the parent has had anxiety they know what it feels like or they want their child to really love them and so there is 
so much accommodation that that child will never be able to function in the world because they don't have to do anything because right. the parent will swoop in. And so it's trying to find that balance mm-hmm. that's somewhere in between. And I like how you phrase like, what's the goal? You know, so if it's going to visit my dad and I have to have a relationship with my dad because that's, that's a value that's important, then we're going to slowly inch, inchworm our way up there or going to school right. or, you know, functioning. Right. The truth, yeah. The, and that's it. The truth is that every child has the same goal and it's to be free of this, to just not live like this. Yeah. That's the goal. So there's no child who doesn't want that who is filled with anxiety, who doesn't want to be like the other kids who are carefree. Um, That's the goal. Yeah. So, um, so I think that that's important for parents to remember. Um, um, You know, I tell kids, I go to schools and I talk to kids about anxiety. um, And one of the things that I tell them, I, I tell them, you know, that facing your fears is the, the best thing you can do. It's, you know, the only, really, truly the only way that you're going to get over or past a fear is to build some sort of an emotional callus. But that I tell them to, um, I say, you know, when you jump into a really cold pool, well, what happens after a few minutes? And they're like, it warms up, you get used to it. And I'm like, you get used to it. And here's the thing is that the temperature of the pool has not changed. So You know, that's one way to look at it is to when you're explaining it to kids. It's like you have to, um, you get used to it, just like you get used to after you jump into a pool. You know, you give them all these other scenarios where um, that they can relate to where they've had the experience already. Yeah. And then, you know, so that, and you build on those um, so that they understand that once you do something, you have experience with it, you know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, the not knowing what's going to happen, which is so terrifying. Exactly. I like that analogy. I use that a lot too. And I, yeah, I, I think analogies are so good for kids and being concrete. And a lot of times I think parents don't spend enough time maybe explaining these things mm-hmm. in the bigger picture. They think their kids are too young to get it. Right. And even today, I always use my kids as examples. Like even today, my seven-year-old, she didn't want to go to school. And part of it was, it's always something different, but you know, her PE teacher, the, the coaches are really mean. They're going to yell. She's on this whole, like, I can't, I'm going to crumble if I'm around any mean people. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's like Amanda was saying, like validating it and saying like, okay, I know that's really hard for you. And then also generalizing it. And I say to my kids all the time, people are going to yell at you. And I get that it's hard because it's hard for me too. So there's the validation part of it. Mm-hmm. But I said today, and I don't know how much my seven-year-old really got it, but I said, you know, think of coach A as like a training, you know, like she's going to yell at you and be mean and you're going to learn how to tolerate that. Like your swimming pool, you know? So right. not only are you going to school, but you're going into like training, you know, it's right. like boot camp for life. Now yeah. they may not get it, but you sprinkle that, that understanding that it's not just go to school and deal with PE. It's like, look, look at your skills that you're building. That's awesome. Right. It's like, also, you know, if, if any, of like, if anyone plays guitar, if any little kids play guitar, it's the same sort of thing. Well, when you first started to play guitar, it was so painful on your fingertips. Like you, you could barely practice. It was so painful. But after a while, you build these calluses and look at you, you're like, you know, playing whole songs. Do you remember in the very beginning when you couldn't even, you know, it's the same concept. So I think just always bringing it back to something that the kids are already familiar with. Yeah. You know, yeah. and re-tech, like recontextualizing it. Yeah, definitely. Like tap into what they're into and use those kind of examples. I think it is mm-hmm. so important. Um, I have a couple of kids in my practice who are into wrestling and that is like the hardest analogy for me to like. Oh God. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so there's a wrestling move. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like, okay, Natasha. But, wow. Yeah. But that's how, I think that's how you can talk to kids. So you have yeah. some amazing words of wisdom. You also like had a really good, like, I think a shift in how to look at separation anxiety in a, in a way that I don't think I typically look at it or even talk about it. So I think that will be hopefully eye opening to a lot of parents who are, who have kids with separation anxiety, because I think, I think someone could listen to your memoir and maybe if they're really not insightful, empathize so much with your story 
that they can move into the other extreme of coddling. And, you know, and so I think it's good to hear, you know, you say, I mean, I didn't get that at the end. I mean, I took it as like a very empowering, like, whoa, we don't, we want to nip this in the bud. (laughs) Right. Get it while they're young. Um, But you also emotionally really get the struggle, you know, that you Mm -hmm. went through separating over and over and the torment that it caused. And so um, I, I like your idea of inching your way, you know, it's this balancing act of inching your way towards the goal and towards progress, you know, checking in Mm -hmm. with your child and making sure they're okay. Yeah. And I mean, I I also think it's really important for parents to not like, don't mastermind your child's reality so that it works in their favor because they need to actually learn um, how to handle reality when it's not in their favor, because that's most of life. Yeah. And, you know, so you are sort of, you're, you're masterminding a false reality for your kid. And then they're going to just wake up one day in, in this horrifying world that they don't know how to, you know, manage or operate in because you've created a life and existence that doesn't exist. Um, so I think it's the coddling can actually end up being really sort of emotionally dangerous for a kid. Yeah. You know? So, so true. I know. And I was telling my seven year old, she's a, she's my front burner issue right now out of my three kids, you know, mm-hmm. like, you're going to have bumps. And if I go and I like smooth out your road as you're going, you're driving down it, then you're never going to know how to like drive over a bump. You're going to see a bump when you get older and you're going to swerve and crash because you've never seen one of those before. So, you know, teaching our kids, we can sit there in the passenger seat and say, Hey, watch out. There's a bump. You know, you might want to hold onto your steering wheel. (laughs) Right. But they have to drive it. They have to go over it. And that's, that's a good point because there is a knee jerk reaction to go in and swoop in and fix everything. Now, some things can be fixed. Some things like you said, aren't that important, or maybe they're just not emotionally ready yet. But I think always having that in the back of your mind of like, where are we trying to go? Where, right. where can we progress to? It's a hard balancing act for sure. It is hard. It is. It's very hard. And, but I do think it's really important to include your kid in all that, you know, and, and, and even if you're, you know, if your child's about to do something that's too hard for them and they want you to like mastermind it for them and say, you know, call Sally's parents and tell her, Um, you know, no one should bring up the fact that I, I don't know, um, don't eat green food. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, as the parent, you can say, well, you know, what are other ways to handle that? Well, let's come up with some other ways together so that, you know, you're actually either having to go in there facing this thing that you don't eat green food or how do you, what do you do when the green food is presented? Let's figure that out. Yeah. You know, what do you do instead of having me call every restaurant or everything or every place and say, my kid doesn't eat green food, take it off the menu. Yeah. You know, um, so, you know, helping your kid uh, manage these different scenarios is like, you're creating new, um, arenas in their brain you're just making their brain bigger yeah 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 that's how you build skills you know it's a it's a simple fix in the beginning and it's a quick fix but long term it's not helpful at all so it might be a little bit more painful to drag it out try to problem solve role play but the the sticking power of that is is so good yeah totally so i I have already recommended your book. <laughs> Thank you so much. Quite a few parents in my sessions just naturally, you know, some people come up and I'm just like, actually, like last week I was still reading it and I had told two parents, you know, you need to listen to this memoir. Um, it's really going to give you that perspective from a child. So Little Panic is the name of your memoir. Yep. And where can people find it? I'm guessing everywhere, but. Um, probably not everywhere, but, um, I, they can find it, um, in independent bookstores, um, in chain bookstores. If your bookstore doesn't have it, you can ask them to carry it, um, which would be really helpful. Um, and of course you can get it on Amazon. The paperback comes out May 14th. So I do recommend people pre-order that, which means buying it 
like not just putting it in your cart, but putting it in your cart and buying it, and then it'll arrive on May 14th at your house. That is cool. And I listened to um, the Audible version. And yeah. I really enjoyed the Audible version because the narrator narrated it beautifully. And Great. Yeah, she had I haven't to... listened to it. I, oh, it's so good. I'm, I'm just not ready. I'm not ready. I'm, I haven't reread it. The only parts I, I've reread are the parts I read aloud when I read at you know, events, but I'm not ready. I just, I'm too afraid that I'm going to, when I say I'm not ready, I mean, I'm not ready to, to face, um, to face a work that I, I feel like I might, um, hear the flaws or I might hear like, Oh God, why? That's the worst sentence. Or, Oh, I see now I should have moved this here. And I don't, I'm too, it's too soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to listen to our own stuff. I totally get that, but everybody else should because it's phenomenal. So a little panic. Um, I highly recommend the audible version. I really enjoyed that. If you like Kindle, Kindle too. Yeah. Oh, Kindle. Yeah. And I mean, I always get books on Amazon, so I'll leave links below so people can click and get it. Um, If you want to really understand your child, this is the way to do it. Understand it from a child's perspective. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was excellent. I could talk to you probably all day. I could too. first discovered Natasha I was in a desperate place with my son and his anxiety was getting worse and we had tried counseling and it was not going well. We were told at that point you know we can't help your son early intervention is great he's too young. Parenting a child with anxiety is not easy and sometimes it feels hopeless. First time we took her to a therapist who then dismissed after about a year and a half putting it down to bad parenting. But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if you could join a community with parents in the same boat, with kids with similar struggles and issues? What if you could have access to resources that will help you with behavior and sleep and avoidance and opposition and fears? What if you can have somebody walk with you on your journey, someone with clinical expertise and parental knowledge. Hi, my name is Natasha Daniels and I'm a child therapist and a mom to three kids. And I've dedicated my life and my career to helping kids with anxiety and OCD, including my own. And now I want to help you too. I have created the AT Parenting Community to do just that. When you join as a member of the community, not only will you get access to resources that will help you with your child's struggles and help your family reduce the chaos in their home, You're going to be joining a community of parents just like you with knowledge, love, and support to give. You will get access to online classes that will help your child and your child's struggles. You'll also get bonus videos and podcast material made just for members. And I've got your kids covered too. You'll have access to a library full of worksheets and videos specially designed for your kids by myself and other therapists. But that's not the best part. You're gonna be getting direct attention from me and I will be giving you support in many different ways. I'll be doing Facebook Lives every single week in our private Facebook group where members can go to talk and get support. I'll also be doing office hours in our private Facebook group. So once a week, you can ask me whatever you want. I'll be available for an hour to answer your direct questions. But if you need a little bit more support, I've got you covered too because I will be doing coaching calls for those that need it twice a month. And for those that need even more support, I'll be doing once a month support group calls. And I'll be doing a member spotlight call. So I'll be picking one member every month and I'll be walking them through the process of helping their children. And you'll have access to the replay and to that phone call as well. Raising a child with anxiety or OCD is hard, but together we can get through it. Natasha gave us practical tools. She wasn't like the books that we had read. If you have a child with anxiety or OCD, she is your go-to woman. Um, Natasha had practical real life advice that we started implementing the day that we listened to them. In a desperate time, 
in my journey with my son, she has been a lifesaver. Her resources have given me hope, they've given me tools and support, and they're some of the best resources you can find out there for anxiety and OCD.